as the oracles of God. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So the law of God stands mm -hmm. unalterable. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, even the one that may seem insignificant, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now it doesn't say just break the commandments. He says, and shall teach men so. So breaking a commandment, that's to loosen in a literal or figurative sense, loosening something up. It can also mean to destroy, to dissolve, or put off. But to loosen, that's loosening a constraint. When God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, loosening that constraint says, well, maybe you can play around a little. Something didn't give outright permission to commit adultery, but they said, oh, maybe you can, yeah, it's, don't worry about it. That's loosening or breaking the commandment. God says those that break the commandments, loosen the commandments, loosen the constraints of the commandments, and shall teach men so, they're the least in the kingdom of heaven. See, when one teaches others to break the commandments of God, that's more than just committing sin. A sin can be repented of. But when one is teaching others to do the same thing that's wrong, that's more than just sin. That's unrepentant and stubborn adherence to sin. Taking that stance in opposition to God. And it's not just one own self committing that sin and being unrepentant. It's causing others to do the same. God really hates that. Sin itself for an individual is bad enough. But when one takes it upon themselves to teach others to sin, whew, that's a bad place to be with God. That's an agent, that's being an agent of Satan in opposition to God. It's basically how God views it. The least in the kingdom of heaven. A very low habitation that's ruled over in darkness. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. That's James 2, verses 10 and 11. That's how God views it. His law is unalterable, and again, every part has significance. And again, that spiritual death penalty applies if a commandment is broken. And the death penalty comes to fruition if there's no repentance and no recovery and no remission from that sin. Now there's the other side of the coin. But whosoever shall do and teach them the commandments of God, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Those are the ones that get to rule over heaven with the Lord in his high habitation of glory. The ones that not only do the commandments of God, but also teach them unto others and train others to walk in that way. Again, like the Lord himself did, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he not only kept the commandments of God his Father, he taught others to do the same. So when we walk through this world as the Lord's representatives, that's what we do also. It's not just about us, it's about who the Lord puts in our path as well. We follow the leading of the Spirit in that. It doesn't mean we go run around handing out tracts and preaching to every single person that we meet. It's a, we follow the appointment of God in it. And He will lead us when we listen to the Spirit. So those that do and teach the commandments of God get to rule over heaven with the Lord. But those others that are breaking the commandments and teaching others to break the commandments, those are the ones that are ruled over in that very low habitation. God giveth to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. 
but to the sinner he giveth travail, to gather and to heap up, that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. That's Ecclesiastes 2, verse 26. Those that are pleasing to God, they get the blessings. And you notice those blessings are intent. They're more of an intangible sort, wisdom, knowledge, and joy. It also says the sinner has to labor and heap up and give to him that is good. Those that have not shall be taken from them, even that which they think they have. And it's given to the righteous. That's how God views it. Because he wants to bless those that are like him. But those that are not like him, they have a little bit, but even that they lose. I had a little conversation with the Lord some time ago. Because I, I could see certain heathen, certain ungodly that were very, yeah, they had great riches. And I, I kind of asked the Lord, well, how come they've got all this nice stuff and everything, and they look like they're doing great? And some of your people, they're, they're struggling a bit. And the Lord, the Lord told me, he said, that's my mercy upon them, the wicked, because that's all they're ever going to get. And step back and think about that for a second, because this life is not permanent. It's not eternal. It's just an eye blink compared to eternity. God is just. Now, he said it's to the sinner that gets this travail or trouble. But here's something else. God loves us so much that the gospel and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ of Nazareth was given to make a way for sinners to be converted into saints and not remain sinners forever. Again, God gave that gift but whosoever will, whosoever is appointed, can enter in. He didn't say, you have to remain a sinner forever. Here's the way out of it. See, that's the mercy and love of God towards each of us. So, any soul that wants to stop being a sinner and get on the road to being a saint, that which is holy before God, here's the first steps. Here's the first commandments of God to be followed to get there. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There has to be repentance. The recognition that those old ways, the ways of the world are wrong, and turning away from them. Being baptized, full immersion in water under holy hands. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. After that comes the gift of the Holy Ghost, the infilling of the Spirit. That's something that's asked for and given of God. That's not something that can be taken by any natural means. It's the gift of God. Now all these things, they're done in faith. When one asks for the Holy Ghost, they ask in faith. Repent in faith, they get baptized in faith believing that those things are worthwhile to do, believing that they have effect, and believing on Jesus Christ of Nazareth for the pardoning of those sins and for the salvation of the soul. Now, it's not just a matter of ticking the checkboxes. We have to believe it also. Now, those first steps in Acts 2.38, those are just the first steps. One does not stop after that but continues learning and growing in the body of Christ, having that fellowship with the Spirit. There's an undergoing of a conversion process of spiritual perfection. Again, there's a conversion from the natural worldly ways into the spiritual ways, and that does take time. But once that first step is made, those first steps are made, we can continue making more steps, a step at a time. So we walk through. That's why it's called a walk with the Lord when we go through this life, because it's a step at a time. We keep advancing farther and farther in the Spirit, mm -hmm. and we don't stop. So that conversion process to spiritual perfection, that's within the fivefold ministry. And I'll, I'll cover that later, a little bit later, what that entails. 
but we don't stop. We keep going and we experience a lifelong and personal relationship with God. It's for the rest of our life, folks. We don't stop. And it doesn't end at the end of our life. It keeps going throughout eternity when we've stuck with it in this life. That's personal and intimate relationship with God. So that's what it means to be great in the kingdom of heaven, to be one with God. Now let's go to verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case or absolutely not enter into the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. That's quite a statement. That word exceed in the Greek, basically it means to superabound or excel or go beyond many times over. Not just, oh, I got a little bit past, way beyond that. So what is the Lord talking about here? Our righteousness is to superabound many times over the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and Pharisees, they were the religious elite of the day back when the Lord walked on earth. They were those that had intensively studied those Old Testament scriptures, those commandments of God, and they were the ones that were supposed to be the spiritual leaders and teachers of the common people because they had that training, that a very elite training in the scriptures of God. But the scribes and Pharisees were hypocrites. They made outward shows of righteousness and required others to obey the commandments of God, but they were not actually being righteous or obeying the commandments of God themselves. That's what it means to be a hypocrite, to tell everybody else what they're supposed to be doing, but not doing the same thing yourself. That's a hypocrite. That's why the Lord told us that our righteousness has to exceed that by many times over. Now, Jesus, he sharply rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. He revealed their true nature, and he let them know how God felt about what they were doing. You can read that for yourself in Matthew 23. That entire chapter is addressed to the scribes and the Pharisees. And he did not pull any punches. Now, you want to look that over. That's a good study. Now, along with Matthew 23, um, Luke 11, verses 37 through 54, also covered a lot of the same points there. I'm not going to go through all of that, but I will read one verse here. It's Luke 11:42. Kind of contains it all in a nutshell, what the Lord was pointing out with the scribes and Pharisees. It says thus, But woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. So what's the point he's making here? Judgment is recognizing that there is a difference between good and evil. Recognizing a difference between light and darkness. And that's how different good and evil are. There's total opposites. They don't mix. And judgment is recognizing that difference and making decisions based on that recognition. Knowing that something is good or evil and acting accordingly and rightly. The love of God, that's the deliverance of the human soul from evil. Now evil, there's a, evil is a very broad term. The love of God shows the difference between good and evil and how to walk in perfect righteousness. So judgment, that's like discerning, discernment between good and evil. The love of God is applying that. We show love to our, our own soul by keeping ourselves on the right path with God and checking ourselves to make sure we're right with God. We also show the love of God in helping our brother to stay on that path. We see a brother that's struggling or a sister that's struggling spiritually. We help them in the love and admonition of the Lord. We don't bring the hammer down on them. We nurture them and say, hey, this is what the Lord said. This is the example he's given us. This is what we're to follow. 